Well, good evening. We certainly would like to keep everything running on time. So it's six o'clock. Um, thank you so much for coming out and joining uh, our community listening tour. Some of you may have been here last year. Uh, we kicked off our community listening tour events and we hit the four towns last year that we're gonna visit again this year. And the purpose of these events are to really hear from our community as to um, what's working and what are suggestions on ways that um, Gifford and our community partners can improve. Last year, we did get a lot of feedback about transportation, um, some social service programs, access to fresh food. So Gifford went back to the table and we immediately knew that we needed to invite some friends to join us. So with us this evening, we have Melanie Gidney from Claire Martin Center. We have Mike Reederer from Tri-Valley Transit and Linda Anderson, um, a local folk here from Capstone, in addition to Dan Bennett, uh, Gifford's CEO. I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm Ashley Lincoln. Um, I work in the Development and Patient Relations Department at Gifford. So I'm going to be moving this event forward tonight, calling on different folks. Everybody's going to have about 10 minutes to do a quick overview of current programs, a status update from each of our partners here at the table, and then we would certainly open the floor up to any questions. But feel free, um, if you have something that's burning and you need to ask right away, I think everybody's very casual and would welcome those questions then. So I'm going to begin by turning it over to Linda Anderson from Capstone. Hey everybody, so Linda Anderson, Capstone Community Action. Um, we were CVCAC, Central Vermont Community Action Council, up until about 10 years ago or so. Um, we are part of a network that uh, consists of five community action agencies in the state of Vermont and a thousand throughout the country. We are an anti-poverty organization. We are dedicated to trying to help people alleviate the impacts of poverty and move out of poverty, find ways that they can um, sustain and um, achieve something more. So. Um, with that in mind, we realize that poverty is not something that has a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, people are not cookie cutter, we are all messy, um, and we all have different needs and different barriers. So, in order to try to address poverty, we come at it from a variety of angles. The department that I work with and oversee is Family Community Support Services. So we are working with folks to try to meet those immediate needs, those basic needs, those immediate crises. So we're working with folks that are literally homeless or about to be. We have a housing counseling program that can help people identify what their strengths are, what their barriers are, what are the things that are getting out in the way of accessing stable, affordable housing. Right now, it just doesn't exist. Um, so we are working with our communities to try to address that aspect. There's no shelter. We're working to try to address that aspect as well. Um, we work with individuals to figure out what does their budget look like? What can they afford? Um, what is it they want and what is it they need? Can we help them look for better employment options? Can we help them identify um, other resources that might be eligible for? and try to stabilize that housing situation. We also have the Energy and Outreach Program, which looks at um, how can we help access funds to fill up your tank. So for folks that have received supplemental fuel assistance, they are, have run out of those funds, they get down to a quarter of a tank of fuel or a week's worth of wood, and they have no resources. Poverty is a reason um, for exigent circumstances. So. If they get to that point, they can give us a call and we can provide um, 125 gallons worth of fuel. There are other funds that we can sometimes tap into as well. So um, electric disconnects we can help with if it's needed to run their heating source. Um, if folks are struggling, it's worth giving us a call to see if there's something we can do. Uh, the ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program, has anybody heard of that? So for folks that are income eligible, three squares, limits, um, we can help them sign up for this benefit, which could give them $30 a month toward their internet bill. It might also provide $100 toward some kind of device, a tablet or toward a laptop, something like that. 
Uh, that's a new program that's come out and we are trying to outreach in our communities and let people know that we can help them access that. Um, that's, that's the base needs. But we go beyond that. We want to wrap around people and help them succeed. So other programs we have are Head Start and Early Head Start. Unfortunately, we do not cover um, Rochester area, that's Sevka, but they do have a program for um, home visiting. I'm not sure if they reach this far. Um, that program helps people get ready for school. It helps them get their kids vaccinated, make sure they're connected to dentists, make sure they're getting the primary care they need, help them with parenting skills. We also have some um, Head Start classrooms in Barry and Lamoille. The Community Economic Development Department works with people on budget coaching, credit coaching. Do you want to start a small business? They have classes and they can help people figure out business plans and try to find some self-sustaining capacity there. Um, they have the VITA program, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, for folks that are income eligible. We will do your taxes for free. And if you're really excited to learn how to do taxes, we're always welcoming volunteers. Um, really exciting stuff. So I would love to talk to you about that and connect you with people if you're interested. That happens from February through April. We do have clinics in our Randolph office. A uh, really exciting program we have is Community Kitchen Academy. That is a workforce development program out of our Barry office. And it helps people who are unemployed or underemployed gain the skills um, for entry into food service. They get their serve safe license, liquor license. We've got a fairly high placement rate out of that program. And the really cool part of that program is that they take food from our food shelf that's about to turn produce and things, and they turn it into frozen meals that they can then filter out through our food shelf, keeping it out of the waste stream. Weatherization, I know we've seen those trucks come through. Um, free weatherization services, they can do energy efficiency testing on your home to see if it's airtight. They can work to help you figure out uh, and to put in more insulation, work on windows, things like that. So um, ways to avoid spending all of that money that you work hard to earn um, on your energy bill. And it helps save our planet too. So those are just some of the ways that we are trying to support our community members um, and help address the issue of poverty. I think that's my time. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Linda. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Melanie, who is here from Clara Martin. And thank you all for taking time out to come listen to us tonight. Uh, we surely appreciate the support of the towns over here in this area. Um, as Ashley said, I'm Melanie Gidney. I'm the executive director at Clara Martin Center. Um, I'm here with Christy Everett, our director of operations, and Melissa Bemis, who is a peer support specialist. And she's also assisting us with a FEMA grant that we just got as a result of the recent flood um, this summer. Um, it's really an honor to be here with these folks. Um, I think we all know that the needs in our community are great. And I think in our small rural areas, it really behooves us as a network of community providers to work together um, to best support each other and build off of our strengths. Um, in regards to Clara Martin Center, we are a community mental health center designated by the state of Vermont uh, to provide mental health and substance use services to the residents of the greater Orange County area. We serve about 1,200 adults, children, and families each year. Um, and we have about 175 to 200 staff. Um, we have offices that are spread out. So our um, kind of our main hub is in Randolph with several locations there. Uh, we also have um, school programs and we're in the schools over here in Rochester. Um, we don't have an office over here, but we are connected in as an access point in the schools. Uh, we go down to Wilder. Uh, we also have um, outpatient services in Bradford and Chelsea. Um, so kind of, you know, I think one of the, the focuses we've tried to have is how to make it easier for people to access services. I think sometimes people feel like they, you know, if they're in Chelsea and they're referred to Bradford or to Randolph, it can be like a black hole. So how can we bring the services to our local communities to make it easier on people to, to access us and, and get the services that they need? Um, 
We also have, you know, our services are office-based, but most of our services are also out in the community. Uh, we have a 24-7, 365-day emergency service uh, program um, and uh, work closely with the hospital at meeting the needs and, and, and providing some services in the ER. Um, we recently, um, one of our biggest, uh, uh, as I said, we we're designated by the state of Vermont, so we are recently uh, certified. We went through a pretty rigorous audit, and uh, we just were redesignated by the state um, and had a really positive review, which I think every it's tough times right now, and people have a lot of needs. So I'm really proud of our organization at a, a difficult time coming out of COVID uh, to be as strong of an organization as we can be. We surely had our workforce challenges. I don't think we've been immune to that. And that surely impacted our ability to be as accessible as we want. Um, but I'm also pleased to report that kind of whatever happened through COVID, we've restabilized kind of our turnover rate. So I'm hoping to turn the, turn the corner there um, in terms of improving our accessibility. Um, in terms of our priorities, uh, I, you know, I think September is, is Suicide Prevention Month, so I thought it opportune that we're here talking about mental health and substance use and just want to highlight that um, and remind people that there is 988 is a text number for resources and then our 800 number at Clara Martin Center is 1-800-639-6360 for anybody that may have questions or is in need of crisis counseling. Um, as I said, coming out of COVID-19, I even think kind of prior to COVID, we've surely seen an increase in demand for mental health and substance use services. And I feel COVID definitely exploited that um, so that currently uh, the demand for those services is kind of at an unprecedented level. Um, and it's surely been a challenge for us to meet that need. Um, so we've really had to be creative um, and look at different ways of programming um, to meet that full need. Uh, one of the ways that we've gone about that is Christy was instrumental in applying for a SAMHSA, a federal grant um, called a CCBHC grant. Um, and CCBHC, the acronym is Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. Um, and we were awarded that grant in 2020, um, and we were the first in the state uh, to be awarded that grant that really allowed us to look at the whole health of, of the person and break down some of those barriers um, or silos that might have been in place before to get treatment. Um, we successfully completed the two-year grant and just recently were awarded another four-year grant to extend um, some of the gains, some of the um, enhancements that we were able to make. So we're really proud to continue that um, as well. Um, there's two areas of focus of that CCBHC grant. Um, I think we're focusing on transition age youth, um, ages 16 to 23. Um, we found that that's a really high risk area that some folks fall through the cracks. So really trying to boost and enhance our services in that area. And then at the other end, elder care services. Um, uh, from our community needs assessment, it's really clear with our aging population that there's significant mental health and substance use um, issues that are impacting our elder care. And some of the isolation and lack of community connectedness, I think, is a real challenge. So um, being able to go out into people's homes to meet them where they're at and maybe hopefully help connect them to the community better. Um, so those two areas um, are an area of focus for us. Um, in addition, I do think, like Linda, we do try to look at what we call the social determinants of health. Um, really, housing is a foundation for anybody's stability. So uh, working with our local partners, but trying to also um, support folks. I think we're all noticing in Vermont an increase in homelessness or people that are at risk of homelessness. Uh, surely, the lack of housing is a problem both from um, the stability and for our clients, but it's also been a barrier for recruitment for staff. Um, so we've been able to recruit people, but they haven't been able to find housing to move here to work here. So um, I would say um, housing in general from a lot of different lenses is a critical issue um, for local and state folks to address. Um, like I said, you know, we're, we're dealing with um, uh, an unprecedented need at our door. Um, and one of the things we were, are working towards is what we call same-day access. 
Um, I think our own data, we've been working on this for many years, um, trying different uh, versions and approaches, um, but our own data has proven that um, the earlier you can serve somebody when they're seeking services, the more likely you are to engage them and the more likely they are to be successful in completing treatment. Um, if somebody calls and we're not able to get them in for a month, um, the chances of them showing at the door when their appointment is scheduled, it's not gonna happen. They change their mind. We've lost our window where they're motivated. Um, and uh, so we are just doing whatever we can to try to improve meeting people when they're at. Uh, we are piloting in Wilder a same day access, same day assessment program two days a week. Um, we refer somebody right in from 8.30 to 12.30, um, and that has been proven successful. So we are looking to try to replicate that um, at our other locations. Um, so it's exciting, um, but it continues to be a challenge. Um, I referenced the workforce challenges. Um, you know, I, like I said, we aren't immune um, to the turnover. Um, and I think what I've realized or we've realized is that our communities are struggling but so are our staff. Um, you know, mental health and substance abuse, we're not immune. So really trying to take a focus on beyond salary and benefits, what can we do to support employees in the workforce, um, support their own wellness, um, to hopefully make it an, an enjoyable place to work um, and hopefully retain them. Um, so we've really, we've had a committee working on this from a lot of different levels. Um, and we were just proud to report uh, awarded the gold level from the governor from the state of Vermont employee wellness program. So I feel like, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's just thinking outside the box um, at what helps people stay in the work. It's, it's high stress um, and compassion fatigue and, you know, I just think it's unique times right now. So. Um, trying to take care of our people. Um, I think our tagline is people, I know our tagline is people helping people, um, but taking care of our staff at the same time. Um, on the horizon is an enhancement to our emergency services. Um, we are trying to do more mobile crisis outreach. Uh, when people are in crisis, being able to go out to people's homes. Um, so there is a grant the state just received. Um, some of that's been staffing to have um, two people be able to go out to a home and work collaboratively um, and from a safety perspective. So uh, we're working with the state on that as well and hopefully in January can enhance the services um, that we have. Uh, some of that is the recruitment um, for, for those positions, but fingers crossed. Um, and Melissa, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about the the FEMA grant, or I think technically this FEMA grant, it's by county itself, and Rochester's outside of Orange County. So um, I think we'll save Melissa for Chelsea, um, but I think we wanted to mention, Melissa, that she's here, and if anybody is dealing with any flood-related issues, anxiety, needs help connecting with resources, she can assist you in connecting with the local representative. Um, so we're here for you, um, and uh, goodness, I always worry about my 10 minutes. There's so much to say and share with you, um, but just really appreciate you folks coming out and, and listening to what we have to offer um, and letting us know what gaps there are from your perspective. Great, thank you, Melanie. Um, we're gonna turn the floor over to Dan Bennett, uh, Gifford's president and CEO. Great, thanks. Um, those of you who just came in, I. I can't speak sitting down, so um, if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to stand up as I go through it. And um, uh, I also want to just note how uh, happy I am uh, to be able to, to, to share the table here with, uh, with all the folks um, up here. Um, you know, um, Melanie just said people helping people, and I think that really embodies what uh, all these organizations do and who we are. We are. Uh, people who come together who have a passion to help other people um, and that is the work we're doing and uh, what you're seeing tonight is that the partnerships that that we have in working in our communities and these are the organizations and the people that we work with um, so we're very happy to have them here tonight and glad that they uh, joined us uh, this year for our um, for our community listening tours um, before I get into some of my other items on here I just want to note um, um, that 
Uh, COVID is still here. Some of you may have, um, may have noticed that. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, Gifford will be doing is to um, re-engage in some of the communication activities that we had done uh, in 2020 into 2021 around COVID. Uh, we had a team of people who uh, actually helped out over here at the Park House um, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2021, it all kind of jumbles together, but um, we did help out over there. And uh, Ashley actually, I think, um, was here one, at least one day uh, preparing uh, dinner over there when uh, there was a, a shortage of people to help out. Um, uh, hopefully we won't get to the point where we have to, uh, where any of us have to jump in to that extent, but uh, we will be reaching out to the different congregate care homes uh, in our area and not just here, but around Orange County and um, throughout Windsor County into Washington, just reminding uh, around what protocols uh, organizations and homes should be following uh, if they do have cases that occur uh, in those settings. Uh, unlike in 2020 and into 2021, uh, people who uh, do test positive for COVID don't necessarily need to go to the emergency department, don't necessarily need to be hospitalized. We're there for them if they do need that. Um, but um, uh, Peter was just uh, 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 telling me the story he heard on the way over. I heard it as well. Uh, Dr. Levine noted um, uh, Vermont's um, head of um, the, the Vermont Center for Disease Control. He's the, the chief doctor in the state. Um, was saying that uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 97% of people now have some antibodies, whether it's from a vaccine or from uh, having uh, had COVID or some combination thereof. So uh, we, we will be providing those supports, but hopefully, um, you know, as we continue to, to, to live with this, it won't have the same impact that it's had. So I want to jump from there into um, what really is the single biggest project we have going on at Gifford right now, and that is uh, we are in the process of implementing a new electronic health record. Um, we're implementing one electronic health record, which is a very good thing, because if any of you um, do interact with Gifford, whether it's in a practice or if it's at the hospital uh, or the emergency department, we have three different electronic health records right now, one for the practices, one for the emergency department, and one for the hospital. Uh, not the best situation. Um, so uh, on October 9th, we're going to uh, flip the switch and we're going to be going live with one system to cover all of those areas. Um, and um, we think that is gonna be a very good thing. Uh, we also are going to go from uh, our current situation where we have two patient portals. There's a patient portal if, uh, that you access to, to have access to your own records uh, in the practice setting. And then there's a separate patient portal to access your records in the hospital setting. Again, not the best situation. Uh, on October 9, we're going to go to one single uh, patient portal. So if you want to access your records, if you want to communicate with your provider, uh, you can do that uh, through one, uh, one portal. You don't have to have multiple passwords and multiple ways of accessing that. Um, uh, we, there are some handouts uh, back there that Ashley brought. Uh, one is a general information sheet about our new patient portal. Uh, if you want to grab that on the way out, um, give you some information about that. Uh, there's also another information sheet up there uh, to show you how to download uh, your record out of the old or one of the old portals uh, because all of that information will not be going over to the new portals um, but you can download that and store that yourself um, uh, and you're going to be able to do that until um, October, until December, December 31st. 31st. Um, if you don't do it before December 31st uh, you would need to call our, um, our medical records department and they could um, provide you access to it uh, in that manner. So it's still there. It's just um, that we will be sunsetting um, the old portals uh, for your access to those old portals. So uh, there is information in the back. So please do grab that if, um, if that would be helpful to you. There's going to be uh, some significant clinical benefits to going from, again, three systems to one system. Um, I saw a lot of heads nodding when I said we had two portals, and that wasn't great. 
Um, imagine yourself being a, a, a primary care provider or a nurse who's working in some setting. They may have to go into anywhere from one to three systems in order to get your information when they're trying to provide care from you. Uh, as of October 9th uh, and going forward, they'll have one system that they, um, that they can do that. That should make our ability to provide care to you much more efficient. Um, so that will be an improvement uh, for them as well as they're providing care to you. It also helps us with one of our other strategic initiatives, which is um, our investment in population health. Um, were any of you here last year when we did the community listening tour? I, I, I think there might be a couple. Um, well, in that meeting, um, uh, Dr. White, Dr. Josh White, who's our chief medical officer, um, he asked the question, um, how many of you uh, want to go to the emergency department this year? And of course, nobody raised their hands because who wants to go to the emergency department if you don't have to? Um, and uh, when we're talking about population health, um, one of the big things we're trying to do with population health, we're trying to uh, help you avoid going to the emergency department. We're trying to help you avoid uh, having to have an inpatient stay. We're trying to help you stay healthy um, and avoid those more costly um, settings of care if that's possible. Um, one of the initiatives that we have with our new electronic health record system is having a structure in a way that um, after you're seen, we're able to uh, use the data that's in there um, about your health to proactively reach out to you to try to help you stay healthier. So if someone has a, has a, a diagnosis of diabetes, um, we would be able to reach out to them with support, with resources, and of course with care that they might need that might help them to manage their disease um, more effectively and stay out of the emergency department or having um, having that progress to the point where they have to go into the hospital. We have actually started a population health department at Gifford. Uh, that's been in place now for about a year. Um, so uh, that is going to be, uh, as we further develop it, we're gonna have health coaches, we're gonna have nurses, um, we're gonna have uh, community health workers who can reach out to you. Um, who, we're gonna be able to design more uh, community outreach programs again, that can um, interact with people proactively and try to help them uh, as they manage uh, their health and uh, for them to stay healthy. So there's a lot tied into this electronic health record. Um, uh, I know it's, uh, at, its, um, uh, at its foundation, it's a, it's a computer system, but it really is um, a, a part of our uh, st strategic direction as we go forward in our uh, efforts to, to make care more responsive to help us open up access and to be more efficient uh, as we're providing care. We have a number of new um, providers. Um, I have, um, I also have uh, progressive lenses now, so I have to, I just found this is, that's, that's the downfall to standing up when you're, um, when you're uh, talking. Um, uh, we have a number of new providers uh, who've joined Gifford or will be joining uh, Gifford uh, very soon. Um, we welcome Dr. Andrea Mendelson. She's an OBGYN physician. Uh, she joined us in May, um, and that's been uh, a position we've been recruiting uh, for some time. Um, they'll actually be, we'll have a second uh, OBGYN um, physician who will be joining us as well uh, in November, Dr. Howard. Um, last year, we welcomed a cardiologist, Dr. Bruce Andrus. Uh, some of you who've um, been around for a while, uh, Dr. Andrus was with us, uh, I think he was with us until around 2016. He's, he was a, a, a Dartmouth-Hitchcock employed physician at that point. He worked with us uh, on a partial basis uh, and then also worked at Dartmouth. But he joined us full time last year. Um, so he belongs to us now, not that we're overly possessive, but it's a very good <laughs> thing. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Andrus um, is, is with us and uh, is a terrific uh, physician. We're very lucky to have him. Uh, in November, I'm sorry, in October, uh, Dr. Doug Weiss is gonna be joining us. He's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he's coming to us out of the US Navy. Uh, he'll be, he just recently finished up his, um, his work with the Navy and uh, he'll be joining us. Uh, so we're very excited to have him. Uh, he also has ties to the area. Um, in uh, around Labor Day, we welcome two primary care physicians, a uh, husband and wife team. 
uh, Drs. Jessica and Ryan Heaney. Uh, Dr. Jessica Heaney works in Randolph, and Dr. Ryan Heaney is at our Bethel practice. Um, and then uh, just recently in August, we, uh, we welcomed um, a nurse practitioner, uh, Liz Vera Good. Uh, she is working in our addiction medicine program uh, in Randolph as well. So uh, a lot of good additions there. Very excited to have uh, those people here. Um, as you know, we, um, we did um, add a nurse practitioner here in our, our Rochester practice, Bridget, um, last year. Might have been earlier this year. She's, um, uh, and uh, I saw a thumbs up back there, and, and we feel the same way. Uh, we're very uh, lucky to have her here. Um, uh, and um, uh, we've talked about workforce. Uh, if those of you who've, um, uh, who do go to our practice here, you, you've noticed that we have had some uh, issues keeping our staffing levels up to, the, to where we want and need them uh, over time. Um, and uh, that, has, that has been an issue um, uh, just in general with workforce. Um, and so at times they've been a little short over there. We've been subbing people in whenever we can, but um, if you are a patient there, I apologize that uh, we haven't been able to have the steady uh, consistent staffing over there, but we are uh, continuing to try to, uh, to make that a priority. Um, and again, we are uh, investing in staff, and Melanie, I think I'm going longer than you did, so you don't have to apologize anymore. Um, we are continuing to invest in our staff, and uh, you all know uh, it's not just healthcare everywhere. Um, there are shortages of uh, people to fill positions. Um, we have educational programs that we're um, that we're invested in at Gifford for nursing staffing. We work with, um, it's not VTC anymore, Vermont, uh, Vermont State University, um, but VTC. Uh, we work with them in their nursing program. We have a number of different programs that we do uh, collaborate with them on. Um, we have a, an in-house uh, training program for medical assistants at Gifford. Uh, we also work with the Stafford Tech Center in Rutland uh, on a program to train uh, LNAs. Um, and uh, like Melanie uh, noted for uh, Clara Martin Center, um, we also uh, are, are investing in the, in the, well, in the welfare of, uh, of, our, um, of our staff as well, and we have provided them access to our own um, counselors in our, uh, in, in our mental health program. Uh, I think we only got a silver in the in the wellness, but we're working to get to uh, to the gold over time, and uh, that is a goal as well. But uh, we have a lot going on, um, and um, we're um, we're very uh, happy that um, our transition last year with Bridget coming in uh, to Rochester practice went well, and um, hoping to have that continue as well. So um, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, take questions now or after we finish. And uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, I would now like to turn it over to our friends at Tri-Valley Transit and Mike Reederer. I'd like to echo everyone's uh, thanks to Ashley and Dan for uh, conducting these events and for inviting partners along. This is wonderful. And of course, to all of you for, uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, Tri-Valley Transit was formed in 2017 with the merger of Stagecoach and Addison County Transit Resources over in Middlebury. So if you're uh, familiar with the Stagecoach name, yep, it's still us. Uh, we continued operating under our separate names for a few years until 2019 when we rolled out our new TVT branding uh, and changed over all of our buses and buildings. Uh, this merger has really been wonderful for us. It's, it's allowed us to work more efficiently, bring the experience of our, of our uh, staff together to really benefit both, uh, both regions of the organization while still maintaining the unique qualities that, uh, that each of the regions uh, uh, have in the terrain and, and people that live there. Uh, so across TVT, we now serve Addison, Orange, and Northern Windsor counties. A uh, little uh, kind of the basics, our mission is to enhance the economic, social, and environmental health of the communities we serve by providing public transportation services that are safe, reliable, accessible, and affordable. Uh, looking at those, those health aspects, uh, economic really 
uh, help people access employment. We help people access education, job training, uh, and on the other end of the economic spectrum, uh, do shopping and, uh, and contribute to the economy. Uh, from the environmental perspective, more people on a bus means fewer single occupancy vehicles on the road. It's better for the environment, less emissions, less gas being used, less other resources as well. Uh, shifting to electric cars is wonderful. It's less gas, less emissions. You still have to build that car. So the bus, you know, more people on the bus, even with electric vehicles, is, is helpful. Uh, the social aspect, uh, we really help people uh, have more independence, uh, especially people that are, are dependent on public transit for their, for their transportation services. Uh, it really gives them a chance to, to be out and not rely on, on uh, friends, family, neighbors to, to give them that ride. I like to personally add to that one that riding our buses, uh, the, the shock to me uh, when, I, when I started with TVT four years ago, it's actually fun to be on the bus. Uh, these, are, these are little communities of riders that, uh, that really enjoy themselves. Uh, we deliver these, these services. We, we strive to reach this mission through th two distinct services. One is our, our public bus routes. Uh, this is familiar and visible to everybody. Big buses driving around town with our, with our logo across them. Uh, we operate both commuter routes and circulator routes uh, in Randolph area and out of Bradford. In Bradford, our commuters run from, I should say I'll focus on the Orange and Northern Windsor region and, uh, and uh, kind of let Addison County slip for now. But in, uh, in Bradford, we run down the I-91 corridor for commuter services with circulator services reaching from Fairley to Woodsville, New Hampshire. Uh, and in the Randolph area, we have commuters uh, going down the I-89 corridor uh, to uh, Lebanon, Hanover, White River Junction. Uh, these, there's seven trips each weekday uh, going, going along those routes. Uh, we have a couple of spurs that reach out to West Lebanon to help people with shopping or to access employment there. And over here, we do a, a nice job of reaching out to the more rural communities as well with extensions to these routes that come out to Rochester, Chelsea, Thetford. Uh, um, and uh, we've actually just changed some of our routes around to help access South Royalton as well. Uh, the Randolph Circulator runs from Randolph Center to Bethel and out to uh, Braintree Monday through Friday. Uh, a little bit of a truncated service, nine, about 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 3.30. Uh, provides a lot of uh, access for people in town to uh, get to Gifford, to get to uh, shopping, uh, reach the food shelf, um, go to pharmacies, uh, a lot of other, other local places in town. The other, the other side of our, I should add, we added a, a uh, shopping trip from, uh, from Rochester to Randolph uh, when Max was closing. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces from those meetings. Uh, we, uh, we were able to put that service on the road, which uh, uh, was an immediate success. And actually with the new store opening, we've still continued to see people on that, on that service, which is, uh, which is really nice. We know no matter, no matter how great that local store is, people are still going to have that need to get to, a, get to a pharmacy or sometimes need that larger supermarket. Uh, the other branch of our service we sometimes think of as our invisible service. It's a dial a ride or demand response service. These are, these, this programs provide door-to-door -door transportation for, uh, for people in need to access the services and places that they need to go. Uh, that dial a ride service breaks down to, a, to several other programs. Our largest is our Medicaid non-emergency medical transportation uh, service. This is for uh, folks eligible for Medicaid that qualify for transportation services uh, because they don't have a car in the household or, or don't have access to that transportation. Uh, we'll provide, under that program, people can access medical, uh, medical services. That's for, for doctor visits, pharmacy visits, uh, specifically cannot use that for food shopping or other, other purposes. Uh, there's also a sub-program under there for folks that do have a vehicle but drive uh, a lot of miles, a lot of medical miles, more than 50 per week. 
uh, we can help out with some reimbursements there. So if anyone's uh, experiencing that situation, you can give us a call and we can work on helping you get enrolled in that program. Uh, our other big one is the Older Adults and People with Disabilities program that we shortened down to O&D. These offer uh, unlimited free rides for people to access critical medical care, cancer treatment, uh, cardiac uh, rehabilitation, dialysis. Uh, those are unlimited. We'll provide free whatever is needed for those. Uh, in addition, we'll do six round trip rides free per month for essentially whatever you need. That can be medical, it can be food shopping, it can, be, uh, it can even be social. Uh, those are usually provided by volunteers. Uh, most of these demand response trips are provided by volunteers using their own vehicles. They volunteer their time, we reimburse them for miles, mileage. And, uh, and they're able to get into these more, uh, more remote places that our, that our buses just can't, can't go. Uh, in addition, under this program, we provide a lot of, uh, a lot of transportation to congregate meal programs uh, to help folks get to, get to those, uh, those services. Uh, a couple of lesser used programs under our dial ride, recovery and job access. Uh, if people are recovering from addiction, uh, we can help out accessing different, different treatment, counseling, uh, services, whatever, whatever is needed under that while we are able to remove that, that disability or age requirement. So regardless of somebody's age or level of ability, we can help them uh, access those services uh, and also uh, to help people gain employment. Um, that can be rides to job interviews, uh, commuting services, job training. Uh, it's a, that's a, this is a pilot program from, uh, from the Agency of Transportation that we've been working on. And uh, frankly, it's been a little underused, so hopefully uh, we can get the word out about that one. And finally, we do have a, a ride match or private pay program. Uh, in some cases, we can uh, provide, you know, use our volunteers to provide these trips for folks that, uh, that don't qualify for free trips, but can pay themselves or if they're working with an insurance company or, or something along those lines, have a third party uh, providing their, their, um, uh, their fees. Uh, frankly, our, our workforce issue, our, with workforce issues, uh, we're not able to get to this level very often. Uh, we do have a, a limited number of volunteers that are really staying busy with those Medicaid and, and O&D trips. Uh, but really, with all these different programs, we recommend that uh, if you have a transport need, transportation need, you give us a call. Our dispatchers uh, are the true experts with these programs and can, uh, can help. Uh, if, you need a, if you need to get somewhere, they can try to find the way to, the way to make it happen. You don't, need to, you don't need to be aware of all of the programs. Uh, and I will say, you know, with, with the workforce concerns and volunteer workforce concerns, uh, we have had to uh, um, deny more trips than we'd like. Uh, we've had to work with people to reschedule appointments and, uh, and, and work around schedules to try to make, a, make those happen. Um, more volunteers means more, uh, more success. So uh, when it comes to the what do we need uh, portion, uh, if you have got a few hours a week and you're able to drive and want to help out, uh, you know, the, uh, our volunteers are the, uh, the driving force behind this program. Uh, we reimburse at 65 and a half cents for every mile driven. That's from your door to, uh, to your pickup to the destination. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of our volunteers find that very helpful uh, and very rewarding, uh, you know, helping people get, you know, so many of our volunteers are, are just so um, uh, lifted up by, by realizing the impact that they have on the community and, and helping people out that aren't necessarily seeing, you know, getting out to see other people. So those drivers are a, our primary contact for them. Um, other things you can do, I think Melanie references support of the towns. All, all the towns that we go to for, for support on town meeting day are, are so generous and so helpful. Um, we certainly appreciate uh, community members that advocate for that, whether it's voting yes or talking to their neighbors about, about our programs. Um, that's a, that's a, a continued need. 
but, uh, but I think the biggest thing anyone can do to support public transportation is to use it. <clears throat> Everyone thinks public transit is a great idea and a much smaller subset actually get on the bus. Uh, so uh, you know, I do encourage folks to, uh, to think about that as an option uh, when you're trying to get around. Um, you know, it, it, it does require planning, it requires a little bit of work, but it can certainly be very rewarding if you're, if you're able to figure those out. And again, can always call us for, um, uh, for help with, with even figuring out the, the easy part of, of when and where to get on the bus and, and where we can take you. So, uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks. So we'd love to open the floor up if there are any questions, suggestions, ideas. Yes. I have one. I live at the Park House, and I'm, we're very concerned about the way that our insurance is set up because we're an independent facility and we're not connected with any organization. We have our own nonprofit. And that means one of the things that came up recently was that if somebody fell down, any one of us, that none of the staff could be allowed to help them get up. Or they could be sued. And that was, you know, it's, but then the concern came to me because I spent years on the rescue squad, was that there needs to be a program, come to the park house, that would teach everybody how to be safe, how to be careful, how if they fell down, how they might be able to help themselves up. And to see that their rooms are safe, that there aren't things that are going to be, you know, causing them to fall or trip or anything. And that as, so we're having a program come to the park house to do a training with all of the residents and the staff would be very, very helpful. And I discussed this with the director. She agreed and she couldn't come tonight, so I said that's <coughs> behind it. So I'm not speaking out of turn. Personally, I have another one. And that's the aging population is constantly increasing. And that does not mean that we all hear very well. And there is not any really handy service for audiology. I wish that Nickard had an audiology department. It would be so helpful. I have been to Dartmouth. It's extremely difficult. It's because you're short of staff, things have been going wrong that literally, you know, it's been very difficult. And I do not want to have to go back there. It just was a terrible strain. My appointment was canceled three times. I finally got there. I was waiting three hours for my appointment because things were just getting all mixed up. And uh, it's just physically too much to do that. It's a large facility for one thing, and you know, but it's wonderful. I've had great experiences there. And when I started off with my problem, it was wonderful. But I haven't been able to uh, sustain that kind of attention that I would make it easy for me. But um, a number of us at the park house have hearing problems and they're not being addressed. Um, that's my bit. <laughs> I'd love to have everybody's telephone number with a card. Do you have a card with telephone numbers? Yes. And that's good. Um, so, so Lolly knows us, so if, she, if, um, if somebody wants to suggest she reach out about the, um, the safety part, we can, we can reach yeah, out I to can. her uh, directly. Mm -hmm about that, um, happy to talk about it. I don't, I don't, can't promise what or when, but, um, but it's definitely a legitimate um, a need. So uh, in terms of the audiology, also a legitimate need, um, but a, a much more difficult thing to solve um, 
there, you know, there aren't a lot of audiologists around to work in rural communities, which uh, is a uh, is a the big problem. Um, you know, and I, so I, so I can't tell you that that's something that we're going to have anytime soon. Um, but we have um, we have noted it as as a need, and when we do our our strategic planning and. Um, we, we will note that, but again, I, I can't promise you tonight that that's something we're going to have soon. Thank you. Yep. Um, may I say something? Um, <clears throat> uh, all that uh, Carol said is, uh, is true. I mean, as far as senior citizens and um, hearing problems, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that Park House is an independent living facility. So it is not the responsibility of Park House to address this. It's an independent, congregate living situation. If uh, Gifford can find a way to um, champion this, that would be great, but it is not Park House's responsibility. It's not their responsibility to uh, to do the training. Well, to, no, to, to monitor. Um, it's, this is independent living, so we can't go into somebody's uh, situation and say, "Oh, well, you're not hearing. You have to do this." No, I, I'm not referring to this here, but I'm saying for some of the The fact of the matter is that we are we are an independent um, congregate mm -hmm. uh, situation and, and that it doesn't uh, that's not in our purview I don't think. But we all understand that. So uh, so it would be great actually if uh, <clears throat> if Gifford uh, could uh, do something in this regard but um, I don't want um, I don't want to say that it is Park House's responsibility it is not. Well, I made the request <coughs> of one of an independent <laughs> residents <laughs> that we have somebody come and help. You know, to make sure that we would know how to get up ourselves if we felt they wanted to. I fathers prevention. And education. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, education. PT. Yes. I think there's a general Yes. Well, I'd like to commend you on the uh, caliber of staff that you have recently seen come to town here to take care of uh, various uh, medical needs of um, people from. I've had interactions with Dr. Anders and also uh, Dr. Anders. Yeah, and a few others, and it's all been top notch, very, very satisfying. The one thing I would like to see the focus on uh, is to do something about getting an optometrist, uh, an ophthalmologist, and to, uh, who, uh, that that and now <clears throat> you have to go to Bari, Bari. Pronounce it or to um, Burlington, and uh, that's a real haul. It's great for the transportation people. <laughs> 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 Somehow, brother, Dr. Flores did a wonderful job for 35 years, but uh, there must be somebody else <laughs> who wants to <laughs> enjoy the cold. And, Um, so I actually have some hearing problems yes. as well, so I didn't catch all that, but um, uh, the, the need for ophthalmology with Dr. Soris having, having retired. We did work with Dr. Soris uh, for about three or four years as he was trying to get ready to retire to recruit somebody. Um, we, we worked jointly with him. We were not able to find somebody to come in. Uh, it's again one of those areas like, audi like audiology um, that it's very difficult to find someone to come into a um, 
to a to a rural setting like this. That being said, it is still on our, our list of services that we do want to add back to the community. Um, but again, it's um, I I can't promise you that that's going to happen quickly. It is um, it is a need we recognize when we've come out last year and this year um, in these discussions. That has been something that has come up. Um, and um, as I noted, we did we we have worked um, with Dr. Sorries specifically to try to bring somebody in, but um, we were not successful uh, to this point. Yes. to come here. Yeah. Well done. And just going along with what my husband Dick said, the preventative measures, he had an incident where he had a cardiac problem, and we, he was transferred from Gifford emergency to Dartmouth, and all turned out really well. But then a follow-up call from Gifford saying, can we have cardiac PT? We want you to come in. And so Dick went three times a week for this cardiac PT, and it was fabulous, and Mark was doing it. Just congratulations on all that. It was fabulous. Yeah, that is uh, the, the the cardiac rehab, cardiac PT is uh, um, a program that um, is very beneficial to the community, and we are we are lucky to be able to do that here. And uh, that's now um, under the medical leadership of Dr. Andrus as well. So that's also a good, a good. Oh, great, great. Well, I'm sorry you had to, but I'm glad he was here to to be able to. I just have. I'm sorry. I just have this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I actually have, it's a question that stems from an experience I had. So my question is about ambulance services for transport for, from Gifford ER to other ERs and the choice of which hospitals you transfer to. And so I'll, I'll give you the short version of why I'm asking about what services, how that's working, which is that my father presented at the Gifford ER at three o'clock in the afternoon with what ended up being a gallstone blocking his bile duct. Um, so it was about six hours from presentation to diagnosis. It happened to be a very busy day. And the service we got to give her, I have no objection to any of that. But from the diagnosis at 9 p.m. on a Wednesday night, it took 17 hours to get him an ambulance transfer. Uh, Fletcher Allen wouldn't take, he needed to go to somewhere that had a specific, someone who could do a specific procedure. Fletcher Allen refused him because they didn't have a bed, a surgeon, or an ambulance. Dartmouth refused him because they had a surgeon, but no bed and no ambulance. Oh Albany gosh. said they would take him because they had a bed and a surgeon, but no ambulance. Oh my gosh. So, and, and again, your doctors were communicating all of this while we were there, but it took 17 hours to get him an ambulance. Um, they called 14 ambulance companies. Ten of them said no outright. They did eventually get one. When we got to Albany, they did not have a bed for him. Oh so he spent another 52 hours in an overflow bed in an emergency room before he was admitted. And then he spent another 17 hours after he was admitted until he had surgery. So he went four and a half days from presentation to surgery. Not because I felt like we got care that was below substandard care at the ER, but it also means that now all of his follow-up care is at Albany. I have not been able to get it transferred. And that's three hours each way for the 30-minute post-op. I have to go back for a stent removal, right? And the service, um, the emergency room staff were very clear that Albany consistently says they have a bed that they don't have, that this was a very common occurrence. So, um, so but this is, to say this is what happened, right? Um, and to say, you know, is this, is this average, is this, this normal? The ambulance in particular was, was the first sticking point. But then the hospital choice of where he was referred to also became a problem because Fletcher Allen said no, uh, Dartmouth said no. I wasn't allowed a private transport because he was already on an IV antibiotic at that point. And I actually requested Concord or Bay State because we have family in that direction. And I don't know if there were reasons that wasn't considered, but Albany was far away from everybody. Um, so that's the background. My question is, we had this experience with ambulance ambulance services and hospital choice that ended up providing us with, with care. That means my father won't let me take him back to Gifford's emergency room under any circumstances, even though he lives here in Rochester. So that's, again, your doctors were wonderful. Your nurses were wonderful. And they were communicating with me. But that was 
four and a half days for an 85 year old man with a gallstone blocking a bile duct. So uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that he had that experience. I'm sorry that you had that experience and continue to have that experience. Secondary to everything that we experienced, we, everybody experienced um, in the pandemic was the beginning of those issues that, um, that you just talked about. Um, um, initially, the, the main issue was that um, the hospitals that we would typically transfer to, and we first typically patients would go to, to, uh, to Dartmouth, Dar Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center or UVM Medical Center, um, you know, often they didn't have beds. Um, and then you start having that wider um, area that you start to look at. And I think the, um, I, I think the highest number that was reported to me by our emergency um, providers was, I think it was 23 or 26. I thought it was 32. It's 32. 32 hospitals that they had to call in one case. And before they could get a hospital to take somebody who needed that higher level of care that we don't provide at Gifford. Um, that has now continued. Initially, it was because beds were full because of COVID. Now it's because beds are, are full with people who can't get discharged to a nursing home or don't have anywhere to go in the community. Um, I was with um, some people who work at UVM Medical Center last week, and I think they said on any given day, at UVM Medical Center, there's something in the neighborhood of 75 to 100 patients who are in hospital beds at UVM Medical Center who don't belong there because they're not sick enough to need those beds, but there's nowhere to send them uh, to that either home or that next level of that nursing home or other level of care. So now that is creating an issue for bed availability. And then the third issue is workforce with, uh, with ambulance services. So even if we find a bed, it doesn't guarantee that there's going to be an ambulance service that's going to have a crew available to transfer them. Or if they have a crew that's there, they don't want to send that crew to Concord or Bay State or where, wherever, because then what happens if there's another call? They don't necessarily have a backup crew. So we're seeing just a really um, a cascading impact of all these things. Um, and no individual organization or person necessarily is doing the wrong thing. But the impact is that we don't have always the availability of care and a movement to the right level of care that we expect and you know we, we deserve. And uh, so it ends up in that situation. Is it the situation that your father had? It's not typical, but it happens more frequently than it ever did. Um, you know, we used to always say that uh, if somebody has a heart attack and they're in the emergency department, um, of course they're going to get to where they need to get when they need to get there. There have been some cases where that's not a possibility. So um, I apologize. I wish that didn't happen. I wish I had more um, more ability to make it so that your uh, someone like your dad doesn't have that experience. Um, but from time to time, we are seeing that, and um, you know, and and people are working on it. Um, you know, from our politicians who are trying to. Uh, entice people to get into different medical fields. I talked about some of the things we're doing with education. Um, the legislature has appropriated a lot of money to uh, try to help organizations and individuals get training and education in healthcare fields, try to make it more attractive for them to do that, try to make it so they don't have to incur so much debt. Um, you know, there are programs to try to support people to get housing so that they can move here and practice in. Uh, in these fields, um, but it takes a long time, and that's a that's a long-term investment. And um, so we are working on it. We are trying to break down some of those barriers. Um, and but we, yes, we've had to send people to Albany. We've had to send people to Bay State, to Concord, to to Boston, uh, and it's not a good situation. I think I heard um, the hospital in Bennington um, uh, sent somebody as far as Philadelphia. Wow. 
um, uh, in the last couple of years. It's, uh, it's horrible for everybody concerned. It's horrible for family members who want to be there for the loved one um, and uh, for the follow-up care that, that you talked about. So um, I, unfortunately, I don't have anything more for you today other than to apologize. So. two things is that I really wanted to emphasize is that Albany said they had a bed and that when we got there they did not and the staff said that that's that's what happened so insofar as you're referring people to Albany just if you can have your emergency <laughs> staff keep that in the back of the head and then the other one was uh, that I requested they consider other hospitals since the ones that they normally would have referred to were already saying no and I can't say that your doctors did not ask because right like they were busy but um, in, insofar as your emergency department is considering where to refer people to, I don't know the process of how they pick, but when they're getting, when they're getting turned down by multiple places, if there's a way, right, like if there's a way to consider family choice when you're getting known in so many other places, you know, um, again, the, the care, they were communicating with me to the best of their ability, but those two, Albany doesn't have beds when they say they do. Lovely people, but no beds. <laughs> and, and, and to consider also going somewhat to the other direction insofar as you can, just as options, right? Like, right. And, that's, and, that's, and that's good feedback. And we, we've, um, we've, we've also added in the uh, overnight, we've added uh, nursing supervisors uh, who are on site so they can assist with some of those calls. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I want to think that our provider probably did do that, but I don't know. Uh, but we have tried to add some resources uh, who are there and can assist them if they have called that 25 or 30 hospitals, yeah. and because uh, that takes a long time, and if they're trying to care for people, it uh, it is a it just extends the the situation for everybody. Um, about a lot of great services here tonight, um, but I, there's a lot of people who should be in the room hearing this that aren't. And so I'm wondering how you, how you all are spreading the message because um, I often hear in my work in food security, I often hear, I know about that. I didn't know this could, this existed. And so I, I know often there's a reliance on digital means of sending information, but the majority of the people that my organization serves are seniors, and we found that non-digital methods of sending out information is is more helpful, but I'm just I'm just uh, my ask is that you use your collective leverage to encourage the government to fully fund 211. As we saw during the flooding, that didn't work out the way it should have. And um, my understanding is that a lot of that came down to a lack of funding and coordination. So um, yeah, you could use your your any kind of sway you might have with the legislative um, folks to to really encourage them to fully fund that. Thank you. Want to comment? Go ahead. <laughs> I've spoken enough. that one of the things that we at Clara Martin Center have been really grateful for is to be able to collaborate with Ashley and her department. Um, we've been able to use their network uh, with their newsletter, uh, to whether it be May is Mental Health Month or to highlight something from a mental health substance use perspective um, and use their network of getting that out to our residents. Uh, it is really hard, I think, to, uh, you know, to, to touch everybody. Um, some people all, it's, if it's not electronic, they don't see it. And then we also know that there's a whole cohort that doesn't use technology, and how do we do that? So that is a challenge. Um, we've also used front porch forums, but again, that's dependent on internet service. It's depending on having a computer or a phone. Um, but trying to bring things to the local level to get that word out. 
Um, we've tried to use uh, updates into the Herald uh, for different initiatives that are going on. Um, but I think that is uh, a challenge for us and also open to your feedback of if there's ways that you find successful um, uh, to let us know as well. Um, you know, I think coming, the, the, this is our best turnout we've had, so thank you for all of you. Um, it is hard in our busy lives to take time out to come and to listen, but your feedback is really important. Um, but it also is a sign of even the, the energy to do this, some of them aren't well attended. So, you know, we have to get creative um, and just try multiple different uh, avenues to, to try to reach people um, and to let us know we are here. Um, you know, I think about Mike, you know, the best thing is to use the transportation, um, but it's, it's, it's shocking to me the level that people don't know who we are. Um, and uh, whether it's town meeting, trying to get, come to, to the town uh, and have conversations, but really, if you have ideas as well, please let us know. Um, so if I could just follow up real quick. I've been part of the network working with the um, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund on the food security plan. Um, we're just wrapping up the work, but in reviewing a lot of the data that we've gotten from across the state, there, a lot of the discussion has been about meeting people where they are, um, collaboration among the service providers, um, and knowledge among the service providers of the resources out there. Um, I was thinking, like, I would love to put flyers about the Eden Valley and River so that people know when, I mean, at, at the center here in Rochester, so that people know when our food pickups are. Um, those sort of things, so that, um, so that we can just catch as many people as possible. Connecting with the school, that's been a challenge. Um, we try to, but there's not, it's a volunteer organization, it's a tiny little organization. And we don't always have the capacity to do that kind of outreach. So um, the more people can be informed about small efforts like this, it would be really helpful to get the word out. I'm glad you mentioned schools because I think that's been an area that we've tried to be able to get the word out for our youth and family. Um, just a great access point. Um, but it is a challenge. Um, no, you were, you what, one thing I'd want to just to add to that, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely uh, right on with so many of these, these statements. Um, what, what I find to be the most helpful are things like this. Uh, you know, an, an ad in a newspaper or, or a, um, you know, even French Port Forum or any of these, these uh, flyers and posters, they give you the, the snapshot that, that, you know, gets you to know about the organization. But, um, but it's so easy to think, I, th I, th I believe it's so easy for people to say, oh, that, that doesn't apply to me or I won't qualify or that's not, you know, that's not available to me. So these kind of conversations uh, really seem to drive our services the best. Uh, so any anyone affiliated with any organization here, you know, we're always happy to get somebody out and, and having that, that conversation and talking about the needs and, and how we can help. Um, and uh, yeah, this was this was brought up earlier too. And I'll I'll say one one thing from from our perspective, we do get a little concerned about our capacity to be able to deliver the services. Uh, you know, <clears throat> our dispatchers field a, a couple of hundred calls every day. Uh, if if that increases, um, you know, we have we have 15 volunteer drivers. We have we have 20 bus drivers. Uh, there's only so much we can do. So the, as much as we want to provide the service, you know, we get a big influx of calls and it's, it's over and over saying, oh, you know, sorry, we don't have someone available. Sorry, we don't have someone available. Um, you know, we want to be, be cognizant of that and, and not be, you know, coming out and making promises for, for something that we're not, you know, necessarily going to be able to deliver on. 
which is, is heartbreaking even saying that, but, um, but it is part of the challenge. I think the most successful things we've found are word of mouth. When Capstone has money, people know. Um, they, they, they spread the word. They're, we're really good at networking. Um, we are social creatures, and when we know that something good is happening, we, we share it with our friends. So um, I think really it is about making sure that our partners know what our services are. The other piece we found is until you need something, it's not going to stick with you. I worked for an organization, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, before I came to Capstone. And we talked to numerous people say, I, I would drive by your sign every day, but until my loved one started experiencing mental health issues, I, I had no reason to look it up. <clears throat> And no reason to understand what it was about. So I think it's when you get to the point where you're experiencing those things, you know, if we can get some key people in our communities to know what is out there, get to our schools, get to our um, hospitals and our local officials and just concerned community members who are in the know with the community and well connected. So you can say when your neighbor comes to you and says, oh my gosh, um, I'm going to lose my house, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lose my apartment, or I'm going to—I don't have any fuel. You can say, "Hey, have you heard about Cap Capstone? They have this program that might help." And what I would say is messaging, please. They might be able to help. Please don't tell them <laughs> that we have money and we're going to give it to you because it's really disappointing um, when they don't qualify. So, but they might be able to help. Give them a call. that I would like to see the hospital hire an uh, endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. um, my husband is a type 2 diabetic, and the last day of the wonderful person that was working up at Kingwood, Katie, she was his la he was her last patient, and that was last April. And then she moved on to her new position. Well, in the meantime, trying to find another person, another doctor, to get him into has been a nightmare, to say the least. There's none in Randolph, there's none in Middlebury. Finally was able to find, there's three or four of them in Rutland. Getting an appointment is another thing. We had to transfer the records, which um, took a while, but they have now been done. And so um, from April 16th, I think was the last appointment, uh, he can get in to see the new doctor on March 28th. Oh. That's almost a whole year that nobody's been paying any attention to his diabetes. And he's on medication. He's not on insulin yet. But with the price of medication, uh, we would love to see him on insulin, but you got to go through the whole process before he can even do that. So it's it, we had been told that there was someone coming in to replace her, and that went on all summer. Finally, in August, when I called over there and I said, is there a person coming or isn't there? Uh, no, they're not coming. It's a housing issue. Okay. So, I, for the last six weeks, I've been scrambling, trying to find him another doctor, and now it's going to be next year. It's disappointing. So I we, mean, are, we are actively recruiting, and again, I don't have... Um, um, that is one we've had more... Uh, um, Katie, uh, John, who you're referring to as a nurse practitioner. So we are, we are looking um, uh, to have another nurse practitioner f uh, fill that role. And, uh, you know, we continue to talk to people and have candidates for that. So, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I can't tell you when, but I'm confident we're going to have somebody in that position. It just, it's uh, like with all the workforce challenges we have, it is taking longer than it has in the past. That was a big loss. She's, she's excellent. Yeah. She's actually stopped uh, practicing. Oh, has she? She was going on to Berlin to teach something. To, to, to be in uh, teaching, yeah. yeah. I apologize. I actually have to leave. My husband has to go over to Randolph to get my daughter from soccer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Linda. It's lovely to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, did you have another question? I'm on the housing committee here in here five years. And back a year ago we had a high neighbor where we invited the whole town to come and people organizations could show what they had and share what they had. And we've been collecting as much as we can to give people but we're planning another well, openings 
Yeah, it's going to be a planning meeting. In the, so any of you to be able to come and share your information to be able to pass it out. I think some of you did at the first one. Yeah. So anyway, this is that. I just happen to have a few. I've ever had a table. This planning phase. So, and when it is. So. It's not to help. <laughs> Spread the word. But you know the problems that we're all facing and you are a world wide. It's just I think you could be I used I did the training and I've been in other countries and done what you do how you what you do when there isn't a job. And I think that's some training that everybody's gonna have to take. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you live where there isn't one you can get to. Are there any other questions? I have a, um, a kudo. <laughs> uh, over the last six months, my husband and I have experienced your um, ER. And I cannot tell you how incredibly accomplished uh, these... Um, the staff was. The doctors were f fantastic. They put every, it was just one, it was a well-oiled machine. It was fabulous each time. I don't want to come back again, but <laughs> I have to say the three were fantastic. In, in our experience with Dick at the ER2, same thing. Just, you know, if we have to go through something like that, it's nice to know that I'm going there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for um, coming out this evening. We always look forward to coming to Rochester. It is such an engaged community. Um, we always enjoy the feedback that we get, and we really do, um, I mean, all of us here at the table, we, we want to hear from you, and we want to see what we can always do better. Uh, that is our goal. Often at the end of these meetings, I walk away um, learning something new about the partners that we get to work with at Gifford. I kind of think that I've got it all figured out, but on the way home, I'll be like, oh, right, Mike can provide that ride the next time I need help. So um, thank you so much. And again, feel free to reach out to any one of us. I don't have a business card, um, but if you call and ask for Ashley at Gifford, they're going to direct you to me. So um, thanks again. And hopefully we don't see you in the ER, but see you in some other capacity. There's some, yep, right here at the back of the room. I can get it for you, okay? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you.